Well, I've got a really optimistic view. I think that the fear for progressives or sort of beating in the heart of every progressive person is that maybe politics has just got too simplified and the media just runs too quickly and tweets are too short and, you know, any complex, interesting reform will never happen. Um, I actually don't think that's right. I think we will have to go back to some of the old fashioned skills that used to be used to persuade people over a longer period of time about the causes that we care about and then we'll have to use the new media and new ways for doing things that in the past were done in town halls or were done in much slower environments. I mean we can barely imagine the leaders of the constitution, uh, you know, the founding fathers now, you know, schlepping from town to town and uh, park meetings and country towns arguing why this was important you know, now we could hardly believe that people would take years to do that. But I think we have to consider how you do that in the new environment and political parties that switch on to that much longer time frame, I think will get better commitment and recognition than parties that focus just on a daily announceable, because that just becomes a shopping list that doesn't really necessarily stand for anything. So I think we have to rethink the way we do our politics, but I'm quite optimistic that the art of political persuasion has a long way to go. We just have to find different ways now of communicating with people to get those big picture issues onto the agenda. I think what's lacking is people think that because the media world is moving faster, that actually policy making has to move faster as well. I actually think the opposite is the case. When the media world moves so fast, we actually need to take more time because people don't see big issues quickly enough. They don't get a snippet of something and then you're on to the next thing. So you have to repeat, repeat, you know, discuss, refine. Uh, and I think we've mistakenly seen the media speed up and we've sped up everything else in politics instead of doing the reverse and taking the time to really win people over to causes. So it will mean we have to change the way we do our politics because otherwise big picture reforms will not be able to survive in this very fast moving environment. And parties then will not be identified with particular causes because they'll just be too quick moving when we really want generational reforms like Medicare or disability care or uh, you know, in the month when Gough Whitlam has just passed, I think we reflect on how long it took for some of those reforms to take hold, but then how closely they've been branded to Labor ever since is a bit of a message that we, I think, need to revisit uh, 40 years on. Well, I think with the benefit of hindsight, we tried to do too many things at once, uh, and particularly in health reform where there's very complex relationships with the states uh, and the Commonwealth and the division of responsibilities is a, is a mess and there's very big ticket um, financial commitments to all these different areas. Probably we didn't pick a small enough number of core issues to really nut out properly, which means we're still facing some of the problems that were there before. Uh, on the other hand, on, on some areas, we were really able to just identify clearly and sharply what we believed in. We were able to build on what other governments had done before, you know, in tobacco control. It, years of really good work at state and federal level meant that people were ready for us to do something that was a world first and we just had to stick to our guns even although there was a lot of criticism and attack from the industry. So I think that's an example of where being prepared to keep, keep on an issue for a long time even although the media cycles move very quickly actually won us credit. Not, not just for people that supported the policy but for people that said oh, they're good on them for sticking to their guns and I think we could do that. We may have to pick a smaller number of issues and and really intensely argue them. And once, I think the public is very responsive when they've 
given the time to actually absorb and understand why you're doing something. And with the benefit of hindsight, we didn't always give them enough time to absorb some of the range of changes we tried to achieve in that short time we were in government. I think the range of uh, issues that health reform crosses and the, the complexity of the federal system was definitely the most complex and certainly trying to negotiate outcomes that were going to deliver long-term reforms. And I'm, I'm really proud of some of the things, some of them that are very unsexy but will be really important in years to come, trying to get national performance standards and national pricing and all those sorts of things you know, is a base upon which you then can build other things, but no one really cares about it and is going to put it on the front page of the paper. So you have to you have to do some of those things, but trying to find the components that really matter to people and explain them in a simple way and stick to that message and work with other parties to deliver it, meaning state governments, not other political parties, um, I think that you know, that's going to keep being a challenge for the time to come and I, and I hope that future Labor governments will have the opportunity to do that. It does, but interestingly the tobacco industry's response to our policies and their, you know, massive investment donating to the Liberal Party in, in huge amounts are uh, spending a lot of money during the 2010 election campaign on advertising. You know, it would make you worry that that sort of money can buy and influence votes. I think, though, that example actually showed the opposite. When the public's been sufficiently well informed and when it's something that's run for a long enough time, the public were onto it in a second, that if the industry was prepared to spend all this money and fight so hard, what we were doing must be actually going to hurt them and therefore mean that less people were going to smoke, which would be a good public health outcome. And I think their heavy handedness actually embarrassed the Liberal Party into voting for the measures. So you, I think it's right to worry about whether big money and big business buys influence and votes in Australia, but I think when the groundwork's been done, People don't like um, any idea or sense that somebody can buy their vote and will stick with a cause that's been properly explained to them. So I, I think it's actually a good example of how you can resist um, the influence of, of big money and big industry players, but it wouldn't have worked and we wouldn't have been able to if there hadn't been a very high public awareness and public cynicism, I think, about what the tobacco industry was trying to do. I was never really worried about the nanny state. I, I mean, I think it's such a funny argument because we accept in life that governments regulate all sorts of things that otherwise would be a disaster. You know, we have to decide that we're going to drive on one side of the road and we've well accepted that you need seat belts and we want kids to have to go to school. And, you know, we already live in a country where there are a lot of rules and the public, if something goes wrong, are the first to turn to government to say, why haven't you regulated this and shouldn't we be able to protect against this? So I think when there was such a clear intervention that could help protect particularly future young generations from taking up a very addictive and very dangerous habit, really if you got accused of being nanny state, I didn't, you know, I didn't really think that was a very powerful argument. Um, but there's always, a, there's always a question about how far you will go and I think again this goes back to the point that if you want to persuade people on a political issue you have to be prepared to do the groundwork and there was a lot of groundwork on tobacco control not, not just from me, from people before me to whose you know, shoulders in a way I got to stand on. Um, you can't just jump in and intervene on something without taking the time to work with the community about why there is a need to do something. And I think that's our mistake. We sometimes identify a problem and jump straight to a solution without actually having worked through and brought the community with us. That's where I think the nanny state can really cut if you're intervening before the community is really even properly appreciating the level of the problem or understanding why the action you want to take uh, will help long term or protect their children, for example.
I think we need to do both. I think if we were going to honour Gough properly, we do want to be able to defend some of the core things that he delivered that changed our nation. And I do think that um, Medicare and the sort of universality of Medicare and not having people uh, pursued for bad debts and put in jail because they couldn't pay for their hospital fees, you know, the sort of thing that didn't happen in my lifetime because it's been such a big change. But what's happening to ordinary Australians was a real motivator for people to want to vote for him and is something, you know, precious and worth the sort of um, equity of it is worth protecting. But I think if we really were going to honour him, we'd still be looking at what the next set of things are that are really going to matter to the community in a in the next century. So what sort of technology issues, what sort of protection for children, what sort of, I mean, disability care, I think is the next generation reform that sort of builds on in a quite radical way uh, what Medicare was doing. But we have to constantly look for that and look to the next generations to help identify what those issues will be. And that would be a better honouring than just remembering the good things that Gough did, but thinking about his courage to pursue the next thing that the community needs. I think it's hard to tell what the next range of things will be. I think technology is going to fundamentally change the way we live um, and I think looking at what will be needed to ensure people can equally share in the benefits of that technology or the opportunities that it unleashes is going to present a whole world of new challenges that, you know, in my political time, you know, we weren't, we were starting to think about with NBN, but perhaps really haven't even appreciated how much it will change our working lives and education and healthcare. And um, I hope that the way we protect our children will be fundamentally changing. I'm really um, proud of establishing the Royal Commission into child abuse in, in institutional care. And I think what we've seen unfold is a real change in the community about what so many institutions did and how what so many people uh, responded that I think it does challenge our thinking that we've got to look at different ways in the future that we're going to keep children safe and trust them when they tell us things and I think the Royal Commission has helped start that debate and there's some real fertile ground then for what we need to build on on top of that. Um, I suspect the ageing of the population will also present, so sort of at the opposite end of the spectrum, a whole range of issues that we haven't properly dealt with about workforce and superannuation and pensions, but also the um, valuable contribution that people want to make later in life, and we haven't worked out a way to properly tap that. Um, but I'm quite relieved that these new set of issues are going to be for the next generation rather than for me. <laughs> I think my strongest feeling is um, how sort of opportunistic they've been um, and not because of the reforms that they're proposing but a number of the things that were on the table when we were in government which we knew were massively difficult and we wanted to deal with them in a bipartisan way. In fact, as the attorney, I um, sent them to our Joint Intelligence Committee uh, and there was just complete uh, opposition and disinterest from the Liberal Party at that time when I thought actually a sort of cross-party approach, for, at least from the major parties, had to be developed and I wasn't, I didn't have a fixed view about where we would end up in that process uh, and then almost instantly when they've got into government and there's been some events occur, and obviously that's an important environment but that they could so immediately then want to pursue not just some of the issues that were on the table when we were there, but go vastly further. I think it, um, there's a risk that they are being too hasty and not properly considering whether the balance is right. But, but it is important. Every government has to put national security and the security of their citizens at the forefront. And I've never been a believer that you know, it's human rights versus national security. It is someone's right to be able to live safe and free from terrorism in their own country. And national governments absolutely have to take that seriously. Um, so I don't have any, any 
beef with them taking it seriously, but I'd like to be able to be more confident that it's not a knee-jerk reaction and that they have properly thought through. And having been in that process and seen how obstructionist they were to, you know, sensible discussion when we were in government, I'm a bit more cynical than a lot of people about whether they're jumping on a bandwagon or not. We do really need to do something here and I think Labor does already have a proud record. I mean, we set up the community legal centres, we established legal aid, um, you know, we've been on the right side of that argument, but those services are just completely overwhelmed in every state and territory and whether it's Commonwealth funded or state funded or a combination, it's always massively under pressure. Um, I, I think it would uh, pay off for us to look at ways we could do that differently into the future. Uh, and I think that community legal centres actually provide really good value for money. And when it comes to things like um, tenancy disputes or family disputes where it really goes to the core of people's basic living environment, employment matters, we've got to find a better way. And um, it's hard to prevent criminal law matters actually swallowing up almost all of the legal aid budget. So I think we do need to think a bit more creatively and we may also need to tackle what is always difficult, but the fees that lawyers charge make it impossible for people to access them and usually too expensive for governments to be able to invest as much as they'd like to. So there must be different models and we need to look at ways to do that or else we will have a you know, increasingly to a two-tiered system for people who can afford to use the legal system and people who are never going to be able to afford to. And that's not, that's not the best way to be. What's well, a tricky question. I, I personally think we need to do both because uh, I don't think you can ever deliver uh, a quality of outcomes in a perfect environment. So I think the fact that you want to give people opportunities, not that everyone will always take them, uh, is important. But I think we do need to focus on what is actually happening. And it's a perfect example maybe of, um, you know, the way the debate always runs about what the taxation system does for housing and how we make it increasingly difficult for people to get into the housing market. No government is going to quickly be able to turn that around, but the Fabians or other active organisations that care about these long-term trends could help build support for a substantial change in that area or many others where it's actually pretty unfashionable for political parties to talk about it, but thinking organisations need to start developing a push for some serious change where you see that the outcomes are not being delivered, although maybe the equal opportunities are there. So I think that the, the Fabians and other sort of non-government organisations are really well placed to be able to be active participants. And with the new media, you know, you've got platforms that were never there before. Um, people are sick of the very tightly held old, old style media and turning to different credible groups for new ideas. So I reckon there's a great area to step into and grab and um, issues that will then help the progressive side of politics take up these issues further down the track. No, I'm not really a big believer in having regrets. I mean, there's plenty of things that, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, you might do slightly differently, or you might allocate your time differently, but I'm really proud of what I was able to do. I'm really proud of what the party did when we were in government. We had our problems, but we were able to deliver some really important changes. And I feel like we will stand the test of time for some of those changes, which is then important to leave things in a healthy state, if you like, for the next generation. We have to look at how we do some things differently because we had some problems that people must learn from, otherwise, you, you know, you risk repeating them. Um, but no, I don't, I don't have regrets. It's a, it's a pointless pastime to have regrets. So I sort of have a policy decision against them. <laughs> wow. 
I don't miss it. I mean, I was in Parliament for 15 years. Uh, I was elected when I was really young. Um, I, it was the right time for me to go, for, for me and for my family, and when I could feel satisfied that I'd achieved some substantial reforms. Uh, and not everyone gets to say that. So I feel pretty privileged. And I think even if you were at risk of missing some of it, there's a lot of downsides too. There's just a high personal toll that's paid. and. Uh, being able to enjoy life in a slightly more leisurely way uh, and still do still work in areas that I'm passionate about and find stimulating uh, is really where I want to be now and those friendships don't disappear when you move out of politics uh, but the 5am phone calls from the media do and that's an upside. Thanks so much for your time. Pleasure.